Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we are here to honor you, to make much of your name, to celebrate the grace of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us, that while we were still sinners, God loved us, provided a Savior for us. And because of that, we have the opportunity to receive new life through Jesus Christ. Father, let this be a wonderful time of celebrating you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, good morning. I, I have heard from more than one person this morning, Pastor, are we becoming Seventh-day Adventists? Well, the answer is maybe today, but, uh, but hopefully not next week. Uh, if you're wondering, if you're watching the recording on this, this is our second snow week, and we have decided that uh, we will uh, have worship on on Saturdays when those opportunities seem to be arising. And I want to say, even though I know there's only about 40 or 50 of you out there, I am grateful that you came here on a Saturday morning, particularly the Handbell Choir. God bless you for being here. It is so nice to preach to people not not just the online group but but it's good to be with you in the house of the lord i have a few announcements uh be sure that uh if you do not yet have your communion packs with you uh we give you the excuse to get up right now and get one of those bring it in we will have communion at the end of the worship service we want you to celebrate that with us if you are watching us online right now go get some grape juice and, and some bread so you can celebrate communion with us we still have our comfort care bottles in the gathering area. Those will be uh, due February 28th. Deacons, we are having a meeting today, believe it or not, at 3 o'clock in the social hall. Uh, we will have a youth Super Bowl party unless it is we get more snow than we think. That will be tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Youth, just show up. We're going to be very COVID conscious but we're going to have a great time. And youth, we are back on Wednesday night. We met last Wednesday night. We were meeting by the grace of God this Wednesday night. If we don't get snowed out, it's going to be a great thing. And also, of course, adults, remember, we are back on Wednesday nights, 630. We have two Bible studies, and they are wonderful. God bless you for coming to worship today at Memorial Baptist Church. Good morning. Will you stand and sing? We've got two wonderful communion hymns to sing together, starting with Let Us Break Bread Together.
As we go into this time of prayer and meditation, we wish to uh, express Christian sympathy to Lily Barker and her family in the loss of Maynard Barker. Uh, the Barkers have attended this church, been members since 1968. They have been here for some time, been very faithful church members. The service for Maynard will be at 11 o'clock, but it is for close family only and we will definitely lift that family up in prayer during this time we continue to lift up in our church those dealing with cancer and his treatments jim harner john clanterbaugh tommy crawford and of course my friend in texas donnie forson pastor of lake sharon community church we lift up to you to those in the hospital Marshall Samuelson, now he is at home, father of Jennifer Fox, but in very serious condition after being in the hospital. Chuala Wilfong is in the hospital uh, re dealing with um, some fluid and some internal, possible internal bleeding as well. She wished that you would pray for her. Continue to ask that God gives us di direction during, for us, unprecedented times and that this be a time of celebrating our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll have a time of meditation, and I'll lead us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as the body of believers, whether in person or online. We are brought together as the family of God, children of God, joined together through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ by your grace and it, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you so much for that. We lift up to you those in our church that have experienced loss or are very concerned about the physical well-being of loved ones. We lift up to you particularly the family of Lily Barker and the loss of Maynard. We pray for your grace upon them during this time. 
We lift up to you those that are dealing with cancer or its after effects of the treatments. We lift up to you Marshall Samuelson, Twyla Wilfong. Father, we pray for our president, for our government, people that have been placed in authority. We pray for anointing and wisdom upon their lives. And Father, we also pray that you give us wisdom as to how we go forward as a church. We are a people called to mission, called to ministry. For people that are, sit across the table from us and also people that are across the world. Anoint us, Father, for your purposes. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I'm excited for you to be able to uh, hear the ministry this morning of the Sounds of Joy, our handbell choir. Um, and um, we're going to be ringing two pieces back to back. Both of them are to um, set the mood and the scene, um, continuing for um, a sharing communion today. Our first song is called Jesus Walk This Lonesome Valley. And um, at some point in the next few weeks, we're going to go into a time of Lent as we start preparing ourselves um, and remember what Jesus did on those 40 days before he gave his life and, and resurrection. So um, you will see the words up um, to this wonderful spiritual on the wall as we are ringing and you can meditate on those as we ring Jesus walked this lonesome valley.
Our next piece is In Remembrance of Me, a song that we sing as a congregation many times, and the words will be on the wall, and you can think on those. We also want to send a little hello um, to our dear sweet sister Lynn White, um, who is a faithful member of this choir but cannot be with us at this point because of COVID restrictions. We were leaving our practice the other night. Matt said to me, you know, I know what we're I know what the point of in remembrance of me is that we're thinking of our Savior. He said, but I I couldn't help but just think in remembrance of Lynn. Um, so Lynn, we know you're watching and we miss you and we look forward to you coming back and bringing with us and, and singing with us and being here. here this morning but uh we give the glory to god but it, it's not not a problem to uh 
offer a round of applause for, for our handbell ministry. <laughs> Praise God for that. I, let me tell you something. I was so impressed to have the handbells here this morning. During normal times, it is nigh unto impossible to get 11 people to agree to come here uh, at, at the same time. But then during COVID, you figure out of 11 people, at least four of them be quarantined. And they're all here this morning on an, a very odd day. So, so uh, you know, Kathy and the handbells, thank you so much for your dedication. That was just absolutely beautiful. And we were blessed by it. This morning, I'm going to ask you to uh, look at a passage from Luke, the second chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 24. And you might want to dog ear uh, Luke because I'm going to, uh, let's say the second chapter, because I'm going to be working out of that for about four or five weeks. And as you're doing that, I, I have a preacher story to tell you, of course. There was a, after the worship service, the pastor finished the service and and afterwards, a, 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 about a 10-year-old boy walked up to him, and he had a, a dollar bill in his hand, and he said, Pastor, I want you to have this. And the pastor took it and said, Well, fine, I'll, I'll put it in the offering plate after we're, we're done here. And he goes, No, no, Pastor, I want you to have that dollar bill. And the pastor said, Well, thank you, but young man, why would you give this to me? And the young boy looked at him with great sympathy and said, Well, because, Pastor, my daddy said, You're the poorest pastor we've ever had. <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't have told that story. <laughs> but you've got to be careful what you say in front of your children. It, it can go in directions that you never intended for it to go. And because of that, you've even got to be uh, offered to be careful to to set a good example because you're the primary template for your children. Today I'm kicking off a series and it's called A, a Church That Raises Children. And by, by children I mean from birth into to physical, mental, spiritual, social maturity. From, from the, the time that they come in here as, as, a, as, a, as an infant all the way to perhaps teenagers, perhaps even into college career. The, to be a church that is concerned about that children are raised in the respect, reverence, and relationship with God. Now, folks, this doesn't just happen as easily as it once did. I mean, what, at one time, most churches were family churches. And people from all ages came to church. And you just made sure you had good programs. And, and children just kind of worked their way up and through the programs. And, of course, you had things for the adults and that type of thing. But as I've shared with you many times, a phenomenon that has happened with the sociology of churches is that we are becoming segregated by ages. You see that even here in, in Augusta County. When I was in Dallas, Texas, working as a youth minister, man, we were seeing it right and left. This is the young people's church. This is the middle adults church. This is where the senior adults, and a lot of it had to do with worship styles more than preaching. And it just caught the churches off guard to where we all know of churches that you go in there and there's no children, no young families, no teenagers in there. Now, I know this morning we hardly have any, but, but it's because of COVID. You're still a family church. I had a wonderful meeting with the winds, with the, the youth Wednesday night. Kathy and I were talking about, it. man, if we get if we get ten to show up, it'll be a big victory. And it was it was about fourteen kids, and, and the Averys helped me, and and I was there as well, and I was just excited. And we have wonderful teenagers. I loved every one of them. I can't wait to the Super Bowl party to see what shows up, that type of thing. And and I know it's a fraction of of what we when we normally have you know, before COVID and what we hope to have post-COVID, but, but, but there's still life there, and there's still 
a lot of children. Man, we kind of had a baby boom during COVID, and it, it bothers me that we weren't able to have child dedication on Mother's Day, but but there was probably seven or eight or nine, or a bunch of uh, children born during this time. Uh, I hope that COVID's alleviated enough to where we can present children. But it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a great day when we're able to have that parent-child dedication service. You're still you still have the opportunity, and you still are a family church. But I got to tell you, it's going to be tougher. You're you're going to have to be more intentional in doing that and it's not just going to take parents of children and parents of teenagers to do that and maybe a few other people that just happen to like children it's going to take an entire church effort and that's why and i'm just going to warn you we're going to be preaching to every age group over the next four five six weeks about what it means to be a church that raises children. What, how I came across this is, is as I was studying for, for um, uh, in the Luke, second chapter of Luke, looking at the Christmas story, and, and I don't know if you realize this, I, I, I talked with the, the, the youth about this. We had a belated Christmas party Wednesday night. Said, There's just not a lot of places in scripture where you read about christmas there's there's a there's a section in matthew and it's not very big and there's a section in in luke and it's not very big and and i preach to them after the the first chapter of of john and you have to tell them that it's actually more of a christmas story we usually don't teach from that but as i was working through that i saw as i read past that there is a whole development cycle of the life of jesus christ we're going to talk about how is this morning how his parents did the right thing of obligations three obligations that they had for him at, at birth and and his i'm going to talk to you senior adult men next week about about a man that 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 God spoke to and stirred, and he affirmed the life of Jesus Christ. See, even senior old men, you have opportunities to affirm children, to affirm teenagers. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about a senior adult woman that, that affirmed Jesus' life. Senior adult woman, you know you've got opportunities to be participate in being a church that raises children and we're going to talk about jesus as a as a child we're going to talk about jesus the the little narrative that we have as as a teenager is a really a middle schooler and, and we're even going to talk about how he came into full cycle of maturity and his parents had a lot to do with that and i'm sure his the clan that he came from but I, I, what's also inferred in there is that the temple had a lot to do with that and i guarantee you his synagogue had a lot to do with jesus christ being raised being a, a, a synagogue a family a, a, a society that believed in raising children in the respect and honoring and worship of god that is part of the calling of this church that is part of the calling of, of any church and man when we're able to open things up i want us to be ready i got danielle bowman sorry to pull, pull you know point you out on the front row but man we're, we're thinking about a, a lot of uh, we're, we're planning on a, a lot of upgrades of how we're doing preschool ministry i'm real excited about that we already repainted the entire preschool suite well uh, you know i've been working hard in the children's area and man we've done a renovation it, it started with taking out old furniture and then well, well let's, let's pick up the carpet and put a new we've done everything up there go up there take a look it's it's wonderful and we got a new resource room that we're working on kathy's doing a lot in there and other people as well and, and uh, we still haven't put down all of the flooring but we're going to do that it's going to be a wonderful thing we've uh, eric before he left did a lot of renovation in the youth area you know we're going to put a lot of effort in the youth and also we are the personnel committee we've got roan sitting right here but the personnel committee is is also i can't tip my head too much about what we're doing but we're working hard and things are very positive. 
looking for somebody that is not just good with youth, but is good with family structures and encouraging children and being a resource for preschool. We want that to happen because we want to be a church that helps to raise children. Boy, I'm about out of breath already. I haven't even got to the scripture passage. Well, what we're going to look at when we start here, we're going to look at Mary and Joseph. Mary is probably about 15 years old at this time. Joseph, probably a little older, about 20 years old. You don't think about 15-year-olds and 20-year-olds being just real responsible, particularly at having children that age. But they were grounded in the Lord, and they made sure that they followed through on their obligations. We're going to see three obligations this morning. First of all, look at verse 21. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angels before he was conceived. Here is the first obligation, is the obligation for being set apart for holiness. It was an obligation to Jewish families to circumcise a boy on the, on the eighth days. Now, they were not aware that this was good for hygiene, and, and we, for the most part in our culture today, practice this. We don't do it as a religious rite unless you're Jewish. But they didn't see it as, as a good hygiene measure. They saw it as something that you did with your male children on the eighth day, something that set them apart. The Jewish people were to be set apart as a holy people. Now, a lot of them at this time got too much wrapped up into legalism and being Jewish, but, but God had set them aside to be a holy people, a people set apart. And so they, were ob they made the obligation of following through with their son, they set the example on the eighth day of his life being here on earth. Now, we're not under obligation for, for circumcision. We, we are, are free of much of the, the Jewish legal practices, even though I will tell you that, that there, many of their hygiene and, and, and uh, other practices, in fact, all of them, were actually pretty healthy for you, pretty good for your body, pretty good for your culture, pretty good for your society. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But we're not under obligation for that. But what we are under, still under obligation for is to be a people holy and set apart. In the New Testament, from 1 Peter 2.9, it tells us that you are a chosen race. I'm going to read this slowly so you can keep up with this. Think through this. A royal priesthood. You are. You are. A holy nation, a people for his possession. They're talking about you. So that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As a people chosen as a, for a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession, us. This is the calling of every Christian. Every Christian today, every Christian that there ever has been, every Christian that there ever was. You are a possession of God. You are set aside for His holiness. The sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you made you positionally holy. And you are in progression of holiness through the God's work, through the Holy Spirit in your life. Are you perfect? You certainly are not. But you are made holy because of what God has done for you and what God is continuing to do for you. You are the bridge that the Holy Spirit most often uses to reach a lost world. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor, faith in Christ is not inherited there are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. Our children must make up their own choices to follow Christ. And that is absolutely true. You do not inherit your faith. But let me say this about this, that children that are raised in the faith 
where their follow where their parents follow through in a good example where their grandparents follow through in faithfulness they are exponentially more likely to follow through in faith in Jesus Christ the earlier that they have that example presented in their life parents God has placed a calling upon you to have an obligation to set a precedence of holiness in their life. Holiness, once again, it means being set aside for God's purposes. It is a calling for all of us. Now, are there children that were raised right in the church and were here every Sunday and Wednesday and, and their parents you know, raised them right in the Lord and they still rebel? Absolutely. Absolutely. But absolutely rebellion and rejecting it is not very common. What is more common is those that were raised in it, and then when they had a little bit of independence, they drifted from it, as many of us did, as I did for a period of time. But when the realities of life come into their, to confront them, or... A lot of times when they start having children, they return back to it because the foundation has been placed in their lives. But children that aren't raised under that or were per, poorly raised under the obligation for holiness, man, they, they have to overcome. They have to overcome their parents' example. And I can tell you that's one of the most difficult things to overcome uh, one of the things i enjoy about youth ministry is is to help work help help teenagers to overcome the disadvantages that their parents put in their lives spiritually but i can tell you it's really hard it's it's really direction than how they were raised parents of children teenagers especially the parents who are just starting out I want to encourage you to take the obligation of being set apart for holiness seriously. How do you do that? Well, it starts in your own life. And it starts with, with you spending time with God just, even just a little bit every day. You've heard me say that if you can do it early today, it'll, it'll, it'll set the trajectory for the rest of your day. But, man, I'll take the middle of the day. I mean, maybe you can have a good half a day if you, if you do it at lunch. What, whatever you got to do to set that in your life. And also, let the church help you. Let the church come alongside you. This is a big part of our mission, is to encourage young families, to encourage parents, to encourage grandparents even, to encourage them to encourage their children and teenagers, to be a church that raises children. Now, let's take a look at verse the, f the first part of verse 22. And when the days of their pur purification according to the law of Moses were finished. The we see here the obligation of, of purification now this is another one of those jewish laws that that may not have made sense to the people at the time because we know a lot more about science today it makes a lot of sense it's they simply obeyed it consistently and what it did it it, it allowed for a woman to 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 stay away from having sex for 40 days it gave her body a chance to heal now uh, of all people in the ancient world the jewish people had the highest standards of hygiene and and health but even with that it's still not to the level of, of what we experience today and so not only allowing a woman to, to for her body to heal but also to keep from introdu introducing infections and that type of thing it was something that god set aside for the health and the well-being particularly of the woman 
But what they saw it as is obedience to God spiritually, allowing him to bring them into a, a time of purification. We have an obligation for purification. Part of spending time with God every day is, is allowing the Holy Spirit to examine you and to reveal to yourself things that, that otherwise you would not have seen about yourself. Things that, that the Holy Spirit helps you to, to, to clarify about yourself. Weak points in your life that, that all of us have. Reflections of of, of the downside of, of many of our strengths and allowing God to, to purify your life. How do you work on spiritual purification? Well, only God himself can do that for you. Make yourself available to listen to God during prayer time. Now, I will tell you something that I'm going to start with the, the youth ministry this Wednesday night. We are going to start training them in a material called Back to Basics. And it's going to show them how to have a quiet time, how to, how to pray, how to study Scripture, how to take notes on sermons so they don't fall asleep, and, and, and a few, a Scripture memory and a bunch of other things. Basic spiritual disciplines that will help the Holy Spirit to speak into their lives. But I tell you something, I bet a lot of you haven't learned some of these basic disciplines that perhaps you should have learned when you were 12, 13, or 14, like we're introducing into the youth ministry. So here's what I'm going to do after I train the youth and after we have Easter and that type of thing for a number of weeks, I'm going to train you on some of these basic disciplines so that, that God can work through the power of His Holy Spirit to begin the, the purification process in your life or to deepen it if it's already there. Now, final verse, final verses. They brought him up to Jerusalem, meaning Jesus, to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Here's your final obligation, the obligation of dedication. Now, I need, to, I need you to understand what is happening here. Since the time of Moses, the firstborn of animals, the, the animals that you possess, and the first male born in the family was dedicated to the Lord. Now, it wasn't long after this principle among the Hebrew people was set that God set aside the Levites as his priestly tribe that their inheritance was the lord and so it was now no longer necessary for the for the firstborn male of the family to be dedicated to the lord to be priest and and to, to do religious obligations and so how they they helped to to fund the the levites whose inheritance was the lord and also help with the temple is that you had an opportunity to redeem that firstborn now for the for the firstborn uh, of animals uh, there was a different scale of how you did that and that type of thing but for the males it was uh five the cost was five shekels you paid five shekels i believe of silver to the church now you're thinking five shekels how much is that well if you're a working class family which about 95 percent of people were that was a lot of money five shekels is worth about two weeks of wages for uh, a hands-on working man, all right? It, it would probably be about $1,500 today. And something that we see in, in here as well is you look at the end of the verse where they have also a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That was also the offering for purification for, that we talked about in, in the previous verse. That was Mary's pur purification. If you are, were a person of substance, you offered a young lamb. But if you were poor, 
you either offer two pigeons or two turtle doves. The reason why they put this in here is to state that Mary and Joseph, well, my goodness, she's 15, he's about 20. They're poor. They're, they're, I imagine those five shekels, that just about broke the bank for them. But yet they had an obligation, they sense an obligation of dedication to support to support the, the, the temple, the church, the Levites, the priests, and to follow through on what God's principles were on their life. But here's the other thing. They brought Jesus in to dedicate him to the Lord. They followed through in that. And Jesus was dedicated to the Lord. And not just through a, a religious principle, but, but also in how they lived. We, we know that Mary Joseph, even we, we, though we have very few references, we know that he was raised in the respect of, of the Lord God Yahweh. We, we know that, that he was raised in the synagogue. We see that later, that, that he has a synagogue that he's a part of. And we also will talk about this in a couple of weeks, how, how they followed through in the obligation of, of going to the temple and, and those type of things. And so they dedicated not only through the religious principle, but also how they lived their lives. Parents, I want to encourage you to dedicate your children to the Lord. Now, the little ceremony that we have for, for babies, that's wonderful, great. I, I think that's a positive thing. They didn't do that when I was growing up in Baptist churches, but it seems like Baptist churches have adopted that. I think it's a great practice. But what really matters is the week-to-week -week dedication that you place into the lives of your children. Once again, partner with us as a church the things that we set aside the, the sunday school when we're able to start that again and and the wednesday night programs when we st are able to start that up again don't don't make it just another option make it a priority in their lives if, if you make it secondary to to basketball and and soccer or television then they're going to grow up seeing that example they're going, to have to, they're going to have to unlearn what you taught them if they're going to grow in the Lord. Make the decision to dedicate your child to the things of the Lord. And even in your prayer time, say, and I did this with my children. I dedicated to them to the Lord. I did not give them a choice. Now, they'll have choices later. But, man, I said, I, I de dedicate my son Garrett to you. I dedicate my, my daughter, Sierra. I've already dedicated my grandchildren. I, I, know, I know it wasn't my right to do, but I did it anyway. Dedicate. And, and grandparents, I, I know that you can be limited at times, but do what you can. Do what you can. Be a support for your children. Bring them if, if, if they will allow you to. Don't be too pushy. Don't be too hard. But, but, man, step in where, where the Holy Spirit gives you an opportunity to dedicate children. Let's, let's partner together. Let's be a church that raises children. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you called us to be a people set aside a royal priesthood how did that happen it happened by your grace and we are saved by your grace and we live by your grace and this this calling to be a, a church and to be families that raise children in the lord it, it really is more than we can do so show us how to be dependent on you Show us how to partner together for those of us that have children and grandchildren and those of us that, that don't. Uh, we love the church of the present and we love the church of the future. And we care that the next generation comes to Christ 
and grows in Christ. Let us participate in that. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to time of, of communion. And, you know, Baptist churches are independent. We don't have to do anything with a denomination if we don't want to. I'm glad we choose to because we're much stronger together than we are apart. But we're, we're independent. And so sometimes it's, it's difficult for us to realize that we're part of a greater family. We're, we're part of a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven here on earth and the kingdom of heaven to come. Communion reminds us of that. Communion is, is one of the few things that all Christian groups have in common, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, Independents, whatever. We have this in common. It, it reminds us of the body that was broken for us. It reminds us the, of the blood that was shed for our sins. And it reminds us that we're part of the family of God, the community of God. All those Christians that have ever been, all those Christians that are here today, and all those Christians that will ever be part of the community, the communion of Jesus Christ. And as we do this, I'm going to ask you to already prepare Go ahead and take your wafer. And also pull the top off your juice. Reading from the 26th verse of the 26th chapter of Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take and eat this is my body this is the body of christ broken for you take and eat our heavenly father we do not do this lightly we know that jesus christ who was with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit at the beginning of creation, took on flesh for 33 years. That flesh, that body, that innocent person came for the purpose of being broken for us because we are sinners and we needed a Savior. We take this in remembrance of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then verse 27 reads as this. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. In remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for you, the shedding of his innocent blood for your sins, take and drink. Amen. Heavenly Father, once again, we do not take this lightly. Jesus Christ did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And that was to play, pay the blood atonement for our sins. Blood atonement is, is strange and foreign to us because for 2,000 years so far, it was Jesus Christ's sacrifice that paid the price for all of our sins. We do this in remembrance of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And verse 29 gives us a promise from our Lord. But I tell you from this moment, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom with you. 
There will come a day, as we read in the 21st chapter of Revelation, that there will be a new heaven. There will be a new earth. There will be a new kingdom of God. Jesus Christ will reign. Boy, that's going to be a great big table that we all sit around and participate in communion with all believers that have ever been and that ever will be in Jesus Christ. What a great day that will be. And then it closes in verse 30. After seeing Psalms, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I invite you to stand. If you're with, um, if, you, if you brought a family member, you may hold hands with them. Otherwise, just kind of reach out, but don't touch as we sing our final song together. Yes, and, and yes, we do put on a mask. you in his grace. Go in peace.